Well, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us whenever you watch this on demand. <laughs> For everybody who's here today, we're basking in the glory of the Lord. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. And I'm going to just start straight away. It's on the screen behind me. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, somebody say, as he was, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became Fully awake, they saw his glory. And the two men who stood with him, and as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And he was saying these things, and as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. I'm going to be speaking from this subject. Prayer is a learning process. Prayer is a learning process. So if you came in today thinking that you have mastered prayer, welcome to the school of prayer. Taught by the Word of God, practiced and experienced and demonstrated by Jesus the Christ. This account is recorded in Mark and Matthew's Gospels. These are known as Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic Gospels. They detail and chronicle the life and ministry of Jesus geographically and chronologically, while John's gospel focuses on seven I am sayings and, and really plays those out and, and, and orders the miracles of Jesus around the sayings of Jesus. It was written much later, near the 90s AD, whereas the Gospels, some of them were penned as early as the 40s to the 50s AD. John's Gospel is much more theological in its structure. But these chronicle the life and ministry of Jesus, and all three of these synoptic Gospels include the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. Mark and Matthew's Gospel mention the height of the mountain. How, how, how large and grand it was. Even though none of them give the location specifically, Matthew and Mark mention the height of the mountain, but Luke's gospel is focused on the activity on the mountain. I'm grateful for Luke's gospel because sometimes I think we can become so enamored with locations and geography we can forget about the activity Jesus is wanting. We can get enamored with places and, and conferences and, and pastors and teachers and what they're doing and what they're saying and get so enamored about those things that we miss the point. Luke, and, and in his Gospel of Luke and in Acts, is careful to record and emphasize the primacy of prayer. Every time something significant is happening in Jesus' life in Luke's Gospel, he's praying. Notice that his baptism in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is praying. And the other ones, it just says that he was baptized by John the Baptist. In Luke's gospel, as he was praying, the heavens opened up. The voice of one from above said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Here at the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke records again that Jesus is going up the mountain to pray. Look closely in verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, he, Jesus, took with him Peter and J John and J I always say James and John, and this text has John and James in the order. So I'm going to mess that up a few times today. Peter and John and James 
went up with him on the mountain to pray. Write this down, learning to be taken up. <laughs> learning to be taken up. Jesus was very strategic with the ones whom he selected to travel with him up the mountain. Notice that there are nine other disciples at the base of the mountain. They're doing ministry. They're doing all kinds of stuff. They're casting out demons or trying to. <laughs> These three are taken up the mountain to pray. And I believe that in this series, Fulfilling the Desire of Jesus, in our 21 days of prayer and fasting, in our prayer summit yesterday, in our prayer connect groups, in the launching of our prayer room, that we are receiving a divine invitation from Jesus who says, I want to take you up this mountain and I want to take you up so that you can learn to be taken up by me to the place of prayer. He wants to take us up, I, I preached last week, he wants to take us up his high and holy mountain. That's why we call it a prayer summit, because yesterday we went up the mountain of his holy presence. And today we went up the mountain, as we sang, of his holy presence. And he wants to take us up that mountain. That's why the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 3, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths he wants to teach us about this prayer journey that's why we're learning to be taken up notice in the text that it's that Luke is very careful in his writing of this account that he said that they went up to the mountain to pray. I'm all about praying as we're living our life. That's what the Apostle Paul would call praying without ceasing. It's an open pipeline of conversation and communication with God always. I'm all about praying in every circumstance, in every situation, and on our way to work, and, and do, throughout our day, and at our meals, and all these places. But this is a little bit different here. This is Jesus saying, I want to take you up to the mountain where there's nobody else but me there. I want to take you somewhere where all the distractions go away, where all the busyness goes away, and it's you and it's me, and we're up there on the mountain with him. Amen. We can become so enamored by our own prayer strategies to pray while we're doing stuff and kind of multitask. Who are my multitaskers in here who are good at doing multiple things at once? See, I cannot carry on a conversation and text someone. I'm very, very bad at that. So I'm like, hang on just a minute. I, I, can't, I can't do this. I, I can't. It's tough for me. I can listen to music, ambient music, and write. If I put on words, I'm going to start singing. It's difficult to multitask for some of us. Others, it may be a gift of yours. Regardless, Jesus says, I want to take you up to the top of this mountain where there's nothing but me and you. I don't want to have to fight for your attention. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to take you up the mountain, and while we're hiking, since we're already hiking, we might as well pray. He said, I'm going to take you to a specific location where it's just me and you and nobody else, and once we get to that place, we are going to get after it in prayer together. Do you see the difference? I love praying as we're going. I love prayer as we're doing things. I'm not saying we should stop doing that. We need to keep on doing that. But we've got to have a steady diet of being taken up to the mountain of his presence. A steady diet of learning to say, okay, Jesus, you're wanting to take me up. I'm going to turn off the TV. I'm going to cancel my plans. It's going to be me and you. And we're going up the high holy mountain of the Lord's presence. Learning to be taken up. It's difficult because it demands that there is a sacrifice. The disciples who went, Peter, John, and James, who went with Jesus, missed out on the exorcism opportunity down below. See, there was all kinds of epic ministry taking place that they wanted to get their hands involved in. 
So many people want to dive into ministry and just get get involved in stuff and just jump right in. And I love participation. I love all that. But sometimes the Lord looks at us and says, why don't you just let me take you up my mountain? Notice in Mark chapter 3, this is a corollary and a parallel to this text. Jesus, before he called his disciples to be sent out, he called them up the mountain just to be with him. And then he sent them out to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to preach and proclaim the gospel. I'm afraid that in our society today, we love to bypass the steps and foundations necessary to build a a, a life of prayer and connection and being tethered to the Lord so that when the first wave of resistance or difficulty or challenge comes, we're out of it. We're done. We quit because we've never been taken up. We've never had those moments with just me and Jesus learning from him and being connected to him. We're so busy doing stuff that we miss out on the mountaintop with him. It takes sacrifice. It will require you saying no to some things, to the primacy and supremacy and beauty of being with him. Will you learn to be taken up today? I'm learning more and more Each day as I walk with him, learning to be taken up to his mountain. But once you arrive and your prayer begins, the text teaches us that something very supernatural takes place in prayer. Because prayer is different than me talking with you. Prayer is not just some rando conversation. Sometimes we make things way too casual. Right? Where it's just so irreverent and conversational. We're talking to the God of the universe. I'm not saying you have to use King James language, but sometimes we're so flippant and casual about it. Like, yeah, I'm just going to chat with God. Yeah, I'm just going to hang out for a minute. Then we can talk and hang out. Like, what? This is God. He made us. He created us. And sometimes in prayer we can miss out of being taken up the mountain because we've brought him down to the valley. Now, he walks in the valley of the shadow of death with us, and he is with us, but it's not about us bringing him down to our level. It's about him taking us up to his level, up to his holy and high mountain. So the text teaches us in verses 29 through 32, write this down. We're learning to access glory. Ooh, hallelujah. And as he was praying, somebody say, as he was As he was, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzlingly white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. As Jesus was praying while he was in this prayer meeting, he and these three inner circle disciples noticed that not everybody was invited up the mountain. This doesn't mean that the nine were less than. It means that perhaps they were not ready for the level of encounter that Peter, James, and John were. That's how you can have 50 people in a room and 10 people experience glory and 40 don't. It's not because God's mad at you. It's not because he doesn't like you. It's not because you're a terrible person. It might just be that you're not prepared to be taken up to that level of glory yet. See, that's not, that's not too exciting because what we like to hear is everybody's on the same place and the same footing and everybody gets a participation trophy and all you know. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So, so this seems like, what kind of God does? What, what's wrong with Jesus taking up these three and leaving nine down at the base of the mountain? What, what's wrong with him? What? He knew that they needed and were ready to experience this level of glory for their future ministries that they were going to lead and pastor and be leading apostles in the church in Jerusalem and in the churches for John and Ephesus. Heaven's occupants came and joined Jesus on the mountain as he prayed. Heaven's occupants, okay? Moses and Elijah did not come up from the ground. They came out of heaven to join while Jesus was praying. Can you imagine the level of glory? 
Jesus began to change his appearance from the outside. But Jesus' transfiguration, his metamorphosis, was different than Moses on the mountain. Moses knew what it was like to go up to a mountain and be surrounded by glory. <laughs> he was up on Mount Sinai where the cloud of God overshadowed him and the law of God came and the mountain shook and trembled and flashes of lightning and thunderings. He knew what it was like for glory to appear. And, and the Bible says that as Moses came down from the mountain, he had to veil his face because there was glory that came upon him and was shining. The glory of Jesus was different than the glory of Moses. Moses' glory came from the outside in. Jesus' glory came from the inside out. And as he began to pray, and as he held this prayer meeting on top of the mountain, the disciples began to see what was deep within him start to come out and leak out into the mountain, the glory, the radiant beauty of the Lord Jesus. They began to see what was underlying all the time, but they did not yet have eyes to see it. They began to see the manifestation of the glory of God. That is the difference between the omniscient, omnipresent God who's always there and the manifest presence of God. See, when we don't really want to seek the presence of God, we make statements like, well, he's already here. He's always with me. Do I really need to press in? Isn't he omniscient, omnipresent, always here with me? What are we talking about, the presence of God? We're not talking about the omnipresence of God everywhere, always. We're talking about the manifestation of his glory. There's a difference. There's a difference. Peter, James, and John began to, they learned, they started to learn, hey, the way you access manifest glory is through prayer. That's the portal. That's the pipeline. That's how you get glory in the earth is through prayer. That's how it's revealed. That's how your eyes are opened up to see it. And that's how your heart is open to experience it through prayer. Prayer is the way we all with unveiled faces behold the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image. Prayer is the way we have access to see what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared beforehand, but God has revealed them to us by the Spirit for the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the depths of God. How do you hear what the Spirit is saying? Through prayer. Prayer is the pipeline. It is the portal that gives access to the manifestation of God's glory in the earth. Hallelujah. I feel this word. If you'll take this and apply it, you're going to see glory in your life. Prayer is the way you see the supernatural. You say, I don't see much happening in my life. Seems kind of dead and dry. Walk me through your prayer life on a daily basis. How much time we investing in needs? Heal my knee. <laughs> needs, it kind of just came into my mind. Heal my knee. Give me money. Thanks for my house. Food's great. Bless it. Even though I'm eating 40,000 calories, help it to the nourishment of my body. Come on, I've had to pray some of those prayers. Lord. <laughs> but, but we look at the level of glory and supernatural access that we have. And, and what does, how is that correlating to our prayer life? Is our prayer life just laundry list of needs? Is it adoration? Is it acknowledgement of his presence? Is it kind of like what we did today was one of the great forms of prayer. It was adoration and adoring prayer. It doesn't have to be so busy with words. It's just saying, oh, you're beautiful. You're wonderful. There's nobody who loves me like you do. There's nobody who loves me like you do. That right there could last you an hour in prayer. And you will see more glory in your life by praying, no one loves me like you do, than heal my cousin's kneecap. Now, we want to intercede for people with, with physical needs, but that can't drive our prayer life. It's only one portion of prayer. And, and what has happened is we, we lack access to glory because we've made prayer transactional 
rather than transformational into glory, it's transactional. My elbow's hurting this morning. Make it better in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And that's the measure of prayer that we pray. I want us to pray that prayer, but that's just a small portion of the conversation we have accessing glory. We don't have what Jesus prayed, but based on the prayer that he taught to his disciples and based on what happened on that mountain, I'm guessing he wasn't saying, Lord, help me to do X, Y, or Z and and heal this person and that person. There was something supernatural taking place in this conversation he was having with the Father. And he meant business when he started. He went up to that mountain to pray. Peter, James, and John got to see They got to see the radiant beauty of Jesus. Sometimes we miss out on his radiant beauty because we have not laid the groundwork in prayer. Oh, may we not miss out on the revelation of Jesus Christ and his glory and his beauty because we will not go up to the mountain when he summons us and invites us. Peter, James, and John got to see some heavenly occupants. This is an incredible, incredible narrative that's happening here. Peter, James, and John were given access to the council of heaven. The conversation of heaven. They began to speak to Jesus about what he was about to accomplish in his departure, meaning his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Heaven had some inside information about his purpose. They started talking to him about it. I imagine there was a level of encouragement. Moses and Elijah who went before, they're surrounding him in the great cloud of witnesses who've gone before Moses representing the law given by God on Mount Sinai. Elijah representing the prophetic tradition and also the prophet like Elijah who would come in the spirit of Elijah and prepare the way of the Lord. He's representing, oh, not just what was, but what is to come through his death, burial, and resurrection. Peter, James, and John got to see and hear a conversation that was heavenly in nature. How many of you are interested in heaven's counsel? I like heaven's counsel a lot better than the five o'clock news. I like heaven's counsel a lot better than a psychology class. I like psychology. I like physiology. I like like all those things. I'm more interested in heaven's counsel. If heaven wants to talk to me about stuff, I want to listen to what heaven's wanting to say. And I want to learn how to access that level of glory. How do you access that level of glory? Through prayer. I'm not saying that angels are going to come and visit you every time you open your mouth in prayer. I'm not saying that you're going to have heavenly visitors every time, but angels came and ministered to Jesus. Heavenly occupants came and appeared. I wouldn't be surprised if heaven sent someone your way to bring encouragement to you, hope to you, faith to you, spur you on. I'm not going to get caught up in manifestations and visitations and all that weird stuff. I just want to get connected to Jesus. Whatever happens, happens. I'm going to be open to it. I'm going to be ready for it. But, but I, I'm, I'm not going to worship that or think that because that didn't happen, I didn't have a good prayer meeting. See, we got some people who are chasing angels and chasing experiences and chasing heavenly visitors to come. I'm chasing Jesus. Whatever happens while I chase him happens. I'm chasing Jesus. I'm going up the mountain with him. If he wants to bring some company, amen. I'm ready for some company. But it's going to be me and him, if not. And we're going to have an amazing time. But, but prayer gives access to this measure of glory in your life. Measure of glory that you may be never experienced. Take you up. So the apostle John, he didn't just experience it once. There's another time in Revelation 4 where heaven's visitors said, come up here and I'll show you what is to come. There's heavenly and divine intelligence and information about the world and the plannings and the, and the coming forth of what is happening in human history. And God is very interested in talking to people about his plans and purposes in the earth. But sometimes we miss out on the invitation and do not access the level of glory intended because we have not learned How in prayer. Peter would later write in his epistle, 2 Peter chapter 1, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Prayer will give you access to the glory of God in your life. It's going to change you. It's going to change your life. I'll never forget there was a, the oh, best thing I know to call him is a psalmist, really. He, he wasn't really a worship pastor, per se, at a church, but he would shepherd different worship pastors and leaders, uh, kind of a network that he had created and written about. And this man had pledged unto the Lord and consecrated himself to the Lord and, and, and made an agreement that any time before ministering through music that he would pray and fast for a significant amount of time. I had no idea who this person was. I was just at a pastor's conference. And, and I step into the auditorium. I have no clue who's ministering, who's going to be there. He's just playing on the piano. And I just start crying. There are about 50 or 60 pastors, and we're, we're all just crying. We hadn't even started the service yet. There was a measure of glory that filled the room. He hadn't even sung yet. He's just playing on the piano. We're all weeping at the altar. There is an access to glory. And it's not because he was talented or because he was gifted. It was a consecration to prayer that accesses glory. I believe that's how we have such frequent visitations from the Lord in our church's worship because there's a commitment to prayer that accesses glory. The text says that there is an appropriate response when glory is accessed. Write this down. We've got to learn to listen. <laughs> there's an appro- when glory shows up, there is an appropriate response. And Verse 33 through 35, and as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let's make three tents, one for you and Moses and Elijah, not knowing what he said. That's very key right there, not not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, as he was, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. we got to learn to listen. Peter, in the midst of this greatest experience he's ever had with God, he gets so excited about the experience, he just starts talking. He says something very spiritual, too. Oh, we're going to see he's trying to pull his Jewish kind of theology and history about, about these, these shelters or tabernacles. It was around the festival of tabernacle time. So he said, watch this. I'm going to tell them that I'm going to build a tabernacle for them. I'm going to sound real spiritual. I'm quoting some Bible and some Jewish theology. And this is going to be a really good answer since, since Moses and Elijah have decided to join Jesus on the mountain. We're going to, make, we're going to give a real spiritual response. Peter had to learn in a very difficult way that saying something, even if it's spiritual, is not always a good thing. Praying something, even if it's spiritual, is not always the right action when the glory of God is upon us. Today, in today's service, we had a tongue and interpretation in accordance with 1 Corinthians chapter 14, a a heavenly language release, maybe an earthly language. I I don't know. I'm not a translator. There are hundreds of earthly languages. And then an interpretation that profits the edification of the body of Christ. And then we began to sing, and and it was spontaneous. That wasn't a song that was written by somebody else. We're just music playing, singing unto the Lord. There's a measure of glory. Sometimes the best thing to do is not say anything. Sometimes by talking, it messes up what God is wanting to impart and teach you and show you and reveal to you. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is be quiet. It's really hard. Can you imagine in a conversation with your spouse or your family or your friend or whoever you came to church with on the way home, you're driving home, and you both start talking at the same time about what you got out of today's service. At the same time, full volume. 
it becomes very difficult to understand what's taking place. Sometimes we fill the bowls of heaven so full with our words that we've never heard what God is wanting to say to us because we're quoting the Bible, we're praying very spiritual things. and Man, it sounds good, and if people heard it, they'd be very impressed by it, and it sounds like it's the right thing. It might even sound like it's a good thing to say, but sometimes the best thing is silence because you cannot listen. I'm not talking about Hearing, I'm talking about listening well while you're speaking. That's why public discourse, debates in every form, local, state, and federal, public discourse has become so discouraging because nobody is listening. Both people are just always talking at the same time. Have you ever tried watching an interview where the interviewer is trying to ask something, but the person being interviewed is just talking? I've watched like three this week where these things are happening. These things are happening all the time where people are just talking. Nobody's listening. didn't even hear the question. I don't even know what's happening. Sometimes we do that with God. We say, I want to hear his voice. Well, how many minutes in the week have you just sat quietly before him and stilled your soul to be still and know that he is God? Being quiet and being still is the hardest spiritual discipline that a person can undergo because it is so difficult. I love having background worship music on. I love having ambient music on. I, I, love, I love sound. I'm a musician, so I love music and those things. But sometimes I just have to shut down everything and just say, Holy Spirit, here, here it is, me and you on the mountain together. What, what are you wanting to say? I'm going to be quiet. What, what do you want to say? Maybe the point of traveling up the mountain is to get us tired enough to be quiet they, they got put to sleep up there. The glory is so strong. The presence is so strong up there. They're just, whoa, laid out before God almost in a, in a slumber. Maybe God has to get so tired sometimes that we'll stop talking. But somehow Peter still found a way. He's like, I am dead before God right now. I'm almost asleep and I'm still talking. He's sleep talking apparently. The Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 was foundational for the Hebrew people. The Shema is the Hebrew term for hear or listen. The passage goes like this, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. They would quote this passage and write it upon these little trinkets and place it with them and it would be in their homes, the Shema. The first word is Shema, listen. Listen. Listen, maybe one of the reasons we're not hearing God clearly is because we don't listen well. This is something I'm trying to put into practice more and more and more. God, again and again in his word, especially the apostle John, again, in the book of Revelation, he says repeatedly, to the one who has a mouth, let him speak. To the one who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. God cares too much for our spiritual lives. He's sending this warning to us. Listen, listen, listen. So Peter didn't get the memo, hey, I'm putting you to sleep. So, so God literally had to interrupt him. As Peter was speaking, a cloud came and enveloped him. I would be horrified. It's like, oh, I've committed heresy. I've committed treason against the Lord. This dark, numinous cloud has enveloped us. And this is it, folks. This is the end. There's lightning. There's thunder. God literally has to boom his voice from heaven, come down and interrupt Peter and say, stop talking and listen to my chosen one. You've got to learn. You've got to grow in prayer. Yes, you might be the rock upon whom I'm going to build my church. Yes, you might be the one to preach the message at Pentecost, but you've got stuff to learn, Peter. And if you do not stop talking, you're going to miss it. Listen to him. 
Learning to listen is one of the greatest things you'll ever do in prayer. Take four, three, four minutes, nothing. Mute out everything and just say, Lord, here I am. I want to listen to you. Then don't say another word. Don't put on music. Don't do anything. It will feel like the longest three minutes you have ever experienced because you're not used to that. I'm not used to that. It goes against everything societally that we have experienced. After the invitation up the mountain to pray, after we learn to access glory, after we learn to listen, Peter, James, and John were taught the main purpose of prayer. Look with me here in verse 36. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Write this down. Learning to see Jesus. Learning to see Jesus. Jesus. After the fanfare of Moses and Elijah and clouds and voices and thundering and lightning, I mean, this is something that's going to transform a person for the rest of their life. You can't experience all that and never be the same again <laughs> when you've seen people who died hundreds and hundreds of years ago come and start talking to Jesus and clouds coming and thunder and voices from the sky. I mean, you can't be the same after that. But the whole point of this transfiguration and this transformational encounter in prayer was so that when all the, all the glory, all the mountaintop, all the peak of the experience had passed by, when they closed their eyes and opened their eyes again, all they saw was Jesus. All they saw was him. Maybe that's the point of going up to the mountain and prayer summits and impartation nights and experiencing glory and waiting in his presence and all that. It's to train us that even after all the height and the emotion and the feeling and the goosebumps and the, oh, I feel God in his presence, that when you open your eyes, when it's all over, all you see is him. Your eyes have been wiped clean of everything else and you're locked with him. When you look out in your life, all you see is him. You see him walking and saying, this is the way, follow me. I'm here, worship me. The angel in Revelation, when giving this insight to John, John fell down and began to worship. And he said, don't worship me, worship God. Sometimes these great experiences with God are to teach us and train us and show us that it's not about the experience, it's about Jesus. The experience is only to bring us ever closer to him. That's what prayer is really about. It's learning to see Jesus every day and it only being about him. That's how the psalmist can say in Psalm 27, 4, One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that will I seek, that I would dwell in the house of the Lord forever and behold his beauty. Sometimes you will hear me use what would maybe be considered romantic language or language of infatuation. It's very biblical. It's beholding the beauty of the Lord. Well, how can you say a Jewish man is beautiful? Because there's no one like him. He is the Lamb of God, the spotless, beautiful, and perfect Lamb. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the finest and the delight of ten thousands upon ten thousands. There is no one like Jesus. Everything in the earth is held by the word of his mouth and it centers around him according to Colossians 1. It's all about Jesus. It's all for him. It's all by him. It's all through him. In him we live and we move and we have our being. There's no No one like Jesus. He's glorious. He's wonderful. He's beautiful. He's mighty. He's perfect. He's awesome. He's awe-inspiring. He's completely and perfectly lovely. There's no one like him. His eyes are like fire. His hair is white like wool now in his resurrected body, according to Revelation chapter 1. His feet are like bronze. 
He holds the scepter of righteousness in his hand. Out of his mouth issues forth a sword which brings judgment to the reprobate nations who stand in the up and oppose his rule and his reign. He rides on a horse like none other that is perfectly white and pure just as he is. He's beautiful. Upon his hands and his wrists are the marks of death, but also the marks of life. Upon his head, the imprint of the crown of thorns exchanged for a beautiful and glorious crown of life. Upon his side, a pierced side that he invited Thomas to place his hand into. He's perfect. He's radiant and he's beautiful. He's wonderful. The purpose of prayer is to get you to that point where you begin to see that about Jesus. It's, it's not some language to try to be mushy gushy or whatever this is biblical language about the glorious and wonderful and matchless son of god there's no one like him he is the groom and we are his bride there is a love there is a desire for the union with him again to see him maranatha lord come Quickly, we want to be with you. Our hearts long for you. We're lovesick for you. Psalm 63 in the Passion Translation says, Oh God of my life, we're lovesick for you. There's a love deep within. Do not lose the love that you had at first, or your lamp will be taken away. Revelation 2 and 3. There's a love. That's the point to see Jesus in prayer. The early 1900s, Helen Limmel, a name you may or may not be familiar with, was an extraordinary musician and composer, had all kinds of musical training, but was diagnosed with an illness. At the time of her diagnosis, she had a, a great opportunity in secular venues with music, but also what she had said is, my heart and my allegiance is to the Lord, and I'm going to give him these talents and these gifts and all of my education and musical training. I'm going to give it to him. She was diagnosed, Helen was, with this strange disease that caused, over time, blindness. When her husband found out about this disease that she was diagnosed with, he said, I'm out. I didn't sign up for this. My response is, yes, you did, for better or for worse. No, nobody, you sign up to covenant together before the Lord God. Nothing breaks that except infidelity according to the word of God or safety, abuse. Now, her husband abandoned her in her greatest moment of need said, I didn't sign up for this. I'm done with you. I, I'm not going to live my life like this anymore. I can't take this. Left her alone. The more she was alone, the more she began to rely on Jesus. The more everybody in her life moved away from her, as her sight dwindled, the more she pressed into prayer. The more she pressed into worship, abandonment by everyone else, and sickness did not jade her view of God, it drew her into him. When other people would have quit, she said, I'm going to keep going in prayer. I'm going to connect with him. I'm not going to leave. And she penned these words, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Although her eyesight was taken from her, she learned to see him in prayer. In fact, when her physical sight was gone, I believe that she began to see Jesus even more clearly. In his radiant beauty and glory. And gave language to generations who would come after her. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full 
and his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Church, stand with me. Amidst all the distraction, good and bad, better or worse, whatever you face, we're learning. We're growing. Prayer is a learning process. We are all novices in the things of the Spirit. What do I mean by that? I mean that we are all on a massive learning curve for all eternity, learning and growing in the things of God. Learning and growing. No matter how old we get, we're learning and growing. We're students and sitting at the feet of Jesus. No matter how much we encounter, no matter how much we experience, we're learning and growing. Prayer is a learning process. We're learning to be taken up the mountain with Him. We're learning to access glory. We're learning to listen and stop talking and interrupting God and just say, what do you want to say to me? We're learning that it's not really about the shaking of the mountain and the, and, the, and, and the visitation of Moses and Elijah and the voice of God booming and echoing on the mountaintop. It's really about seeing him more clearly. And he was all alone after all that. And they looked at Jesus. If you're under the sound of my voice today and you say, I want to learn I want to take this journey of learning about prayer. I, I'm ready to go on this journey to grow deeper and do deeper. I'm ready to be a student at his feet. Just stick both hands in the air and say, here I am, Lord. Here, here I am. Here, here I am. I'm, I'm, teach me your ways. Come, I'm coming to your holy and high mountain. Teach me your ways. Instruct me, Lord Jesus by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Come and teach me by your word. Teach me by your spirit. Teach me by your church. Teach me in the fellowship of believers. Teach me, Lord Jesus. Help me be pliable. Help me have a teachable spirit. Help me not feel like I've already mastered this thing. I already got this thing down. It's time to move on and go past that. No, prayer is the main thing. It's the pipeline to the glorious presence of the Lord Jesus. It's the pipeline to see you. It's the foundation. Teach us, Lord. Go on, just open your mouth to the Lord and say, teach me, Lord. Teach me. Teach me. Teach us to pray. Just like the early disciples asked, teach us to pray. Teach us. We're ready to learn. We're ready to learn. I've given a message I feel that was from the Lord, but ultimately it's the Holy Spirit who's going to apply this to our life. He's going to walk with us in the morning when we wake. He's going to walk with us in the the midday when we're at work. He's going to walk with us in the evening. He's going to instruct us and pull us away and say, come up here to my high and holy mountain. Access my glory. Listen to what I have to say to you and see me more clearly. Lord Jesus, we want to see you. Wipe away. Wipe away the dirt, the muck and the mire, the world from our eyes that we may see you in your radiant beauty. Lord Jesus, we want to see you in your radiant beauty just as these three did. So that when we go down the mountain with you, when we come down, we're right with you when you speak to the demoniac and you say, be freed, be healed, be cleansed, be set free. That we're right there with you to do mighty exploits in your name. That we're right there with you when you send us out to lay hands on the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. That we're right there with you. Oh, but we got to be up. we got to be taken up first to the high and holy mountain of the Lord. Take us up. Take us out. And take us in. So church today, I bless you in the name of God the Father. I bless you in the name of God the Son. And I bless you in the name of God the Holy Spirit. I bless you this week to be taken up by the Lord Jesus himself to the mountain to pray that you would find a consecrated space for just you and him no distractions no busyness no limits just you and him whatever he wants whatever he speaks i bless your ears to be open to hear the words of the lord to hear the voice of the holy spirit speak unto you mysteries too deep for words mysteries too great to comprehend what eye has not seen, what your ears have never heard before. 
to hear it like never before. I bless your heart to open up and be sensitive to to be a person of prayer where you don't say any longer I can take it or leave it, but that your heart would be so pliable and malleable before the Lord that you say, I gotta be in the house of prayer. I have to be in the place of prayer. And I bless your hands and feet once you have been in the place of prayer that you are sent out with hands of healing with hands and feet covered with the preparation and the readiness of the gospel of peace, ready to carry the kingdom of God into the darkness of our world. So let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him in Jesus' name. Amen.